Well, this morning we come to our series, this Advent season, in which, uh, through the encouragement of uh, Paul Tripp, a bib- biblical preacher and counselor, to think about telling the whole storyline of Christmas rather than simply talking about Christ himself, but painting a picture of the need of Christ people, of the promise of the coming of Christ. And this morning we come to that of the announcement of his coming. So I invite your attention to the Gospel of Luke in chapter 2. We'll read only one verse this morning, the angelic call, the angelic announcement. If you would, would you stand, please? Even though we read only one verse, we read it as God's Word. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Well, let's pray for God's leadership. Father, this is your word. May it be our rule. May your spirit be our teacher and your greater glory, our supreme concern. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Trip notes, it was by far the most important event ever accompanied by the most important announcement ever. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Perhaps you recognize this is already the third Christmas carol in the Gospel of Luke. And like the other two, this one was spoken rather than sung. Yet it was written in a poetic form that has often been set to music, and indeed we sing. And like the other lyrics, this one's commonly known by its first words in Latin, Gloria in excelsis Deo, glory to God in the highest. I wonder how many people understand what these words really mean. I wonder, do we? Yes, it is a hymn of celebration, a celebration of that baby's birth, of Messiah that was promised. But these words also, in a very clear way, define your need and mine. And in defining our need, they define the mission of that baby in the manger. Tripp notes that if they define our need, and these words define his mission, then what we can hear in these words are not only an announcement of his birth, but these words indeed predict his death. These words really do capture our need. The two chief words in this song are glory and peace. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. And this is where Tripp in uh, writing on this was very helpful to me. And I, I must confess that I'd never considered this song in that light, in the light that I'm going to share. And perhaps you've really never thought about this song in this way. He begins, he said, I don't know if you know this about yourself, but you are glory focused. You are glory attentive. You're glory seeking. In fact, you're a bit glory obsessed. Everything you do in your life Everything you say, every choice you make, 
every reaction in your relationships is done in pursuit of some kind of glory. You say, wait a minute, Wayne, what are you saying? What do you mean? Well, this is where he helped me think through this particular song. So let's take a biblical tour. Why are you here? Why do you exist? Well, if you're a Westminster Catechism guy or gal, you know the answer to that. Why are you here? How did He make you? Why did God make you? Why did He create you? He created us for what? His glory. And to enjoy Him forever. You were created to live with the glory of God in view. You were created so that the principal motivation in your life would be that God would be praised, that God would be pleased. You were created to live in a Godward existence with an upward focused existence for the glory of God. And we know that creation was designed to remind us of, to point us to the glory of God. That everything that is created was meant to be a finger, as it were, pointing us to the person and the character of God, to the plan of God, that we would be reminded again and again that everywhere we look, God is. And God must be the center of our existence. Whether it's a beautiful song by a bird in the early morning or the bright colors of the changing of leaves in the fall or the frightening approach of a scary storm or the touch of another human being's hand or the brightness of the morning or the darkness of the night. All of those things, all of those glories of creation are but shadow glories that are meant to reflect the one ultimate glory, the truly glorious glory of God. That's the way it was meant to happen. But in a sad moment of disobedience and rebellion, Adam and Eve chose rather to live for the glory of the creation rather than the glory of God. They wanted something in the creation more than they wanted God. And ever since that horrible moment, there has been within all of our hearts what Tripp called glory confusion and a glory war. In other words, we don't always live for the glory of God. There are other glories in our lives that compete within our hearts for that one true glory. Very often, we simply forget God's glory and we live for other glories. In fact, we could argue that every sin has at its root an exchange of God's glory for some lesser glory in creation. For instance, what is lost about? You see, lost would exchange the glory of God for the glory of momentary sexual pleasure. Or materialism. Materialism replaces the glory of God with the possession of physical things. Pride. Pride chooses more to live for self than the glory of God. Indeed, we are all glory confused, and in some way we're all glory thieves. 
And if you reflect on your world this week, you probably wouldn't be able to say that in every way possible, you lived with the glory of God in view this week. You probably couldn't say that, or at least honestly you couldn't. For there are times when other shadow glories become more precious to you and you convince yourself that you just can't live without them. And so your life becomes dictated by the worship of what was created rather than by the worship of the Creator. And that never, never leads to a heart that's at rest. It never leads to inner peace. It never leads to satisfaction. Why? Because the shadow glories cannot fulfill your heart. They weren't designed to do that. You can't turn the created world into your own personal Messiah. It will never work. And so at the end of the day, we have a glory problem. And all of us are still yet in the midst of a glory war. We all have those times of glory confusion in our lives. We all have times where we want the creation more than we desire the Creator. Glory to God in the highest we sing. But imagine, imagine what the world would really be like if every person lived that way. Imagine what it would be like to live in a world where every heart of every human being was ruled by the glory of God. And quickly we would say, even so, come Lord Jesus now, friend, I am not here talking, first of all, about a spiritual matter or, or even a, 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 about a religious aspect. This is simply how God designed human beings to live. All human beings were called, were created to live for the glory of God. That's what it means to be human. That was the creation plan. And then in a moment of self-glory and rebellion, all of us live in the middle of a glory war and glory confusion thus results. And that's where we are today. A second word that's key, that's principal in this brief hymn in the Scripture is that word peace. Peace among those with whom he is pleased. You and I were created for peace with God. We were created so that the most important thing in our lives would be this personal relationship with God. We were created to have the high honor of being worshipful, obedient friends of God. That friendship with God that we would find to be the most meaningful reality of our lives is what God has designed. And therefore, peace with God then would allow us to have peace within. Not, not, not because we're wise, nor, nor because we're strong, nor even because we know of what's coming down the road or what's happening next, but instead, peace 
within because we have this relationship with the one who rules it all and who guides us by his hand. And so because of this intimate personal relationship with God, even though we don't know all that we need to know and we can't predict the next day or how some things might turn out, we have peace, rest, in our hearts, we have that shalom that the Old Testament describes that relationship with God in. But that shalom is shattered. And when that happens, then the result is our hearts are not at rest. You remember from your reading in Scripture in the book of Genesis, that horrible moment in the garden where God comes down in the cool of the day, we're told, to commune with Adam and Eve. It's, it's a, such a beautiful picture. These are friends of God. And He would walk with them and talk with them and commune with them in the cool of the day. What a beautiful, idyllic thought. And yet, one day when he came down, Adam and Eve were running. But they weren't running to meet him. They're not excited now to see him. Why? Why? Because now they're hiding in guilt and fear because they have been disobedient. And that shalom, that peace with God, that peace within has been shattered. I love that word, shalom, because it, it pictures more than just the absence of conflict. It really en encapsulates that all things are in their proper order. All things are working as they were designed to work. Peace with God means that I have peace inside. But we don't always have that, do we? All of us have the experience of anxiety at times. Sometimes we have anxiety that we can't escape. Or there's anger or frustration or discouragement or hopelessness. Our hearts seem to constantly be wrestling and struggling to rest. Have you had any sleepless nights Lately, where your mind races over all of the what-ifs. Peace with God equals peace within. But that third peace for which we were created is a peace with others. You see, when I don't have peace with God and I don't have peace inside myself. It really makes it hard for me to live at peace with others. And so our lives are often marked by conflict. And I don't think anyone in this room can say you've had a conflict-free 2023, have we? I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? All around us is this unrest. All around us is this constant turmoil and conflict. We have a peace problem. Brokenness with God leads to brokenness within, which leads to brokenness in the community that's around us. 
This song really does then capture the great human dilemma, glory, thieves, shalom, shattered, and in defining our need. This little song, this little hymn really points us to the mission of the Messiah. And you know this, you know that Jesus didn't first come on a political mission to establish an earthly kingdom, no, nor did he come on an educational mission just to correct our worldview. He didn't even come on a psychological mission just to make sure that we felt okay. In fact, he didn't even come on a religious mission to make sure that you did external, religiously appropriate things. No, no, Jesus' mission is much more radical and much more fundamental than that. And if you don't understand that, then you have misunderstood his mission and you surely don't know what that song is about. You see, if I have a glory problem and if I have a peace problem, then ultimately what I have and what you have is a heart problem. My problem is not so much my relationships or my situation or even my location. My problem is something broken within, something torn in my heart David gets it right when he prays in the psalm, Create in me a clean heart, O God. That's what we need. A radical, personal, long-term heart change because that's the seat of our problem. And the prophecies of the coming Christ are very, very clear. It, they tell us he is coming to address that problem. We read in Jeremiah, we read in Ezekiel that I will give them a new heart. I will take out that heart of stone and I'll replace it with a heart of flesh. That is, this work, this stony heart which is resistant to change would become a heart alive, beating by God's work and now able to change. And that people who once lived for their own glory would now, by His grace, live for His glory. Oh, not just in religious matters either, but in their words and their thoughts and their homes and their communities, their relationships and their desires. They would long to live for the glory of God in everyday life. So listen, it's, it's, it's not okay that masses and masses of human beings do not live in peace with God. It's not okay. It's not okay that people who walk these streets live apart from peace with God. It's not okay that masses of people in the United States couldn't care any less about peace with God. It's not okay that in the nations around the world, masses of people live with no knowledge of what it means to live in peace with God. It's not okay. And it's not okay because the epicenter, the center of all human in existence is to be in a relationship with God. And as you walk the streets, as you walk the stores, as you realize that people don't understand this, it ought to break our hearts. It ought to make us weep because we cannot become comfortable knowing that so many are out of peace with God and live with a broken relationship. That's why Jesus came. What a tragedy to wake up in my whole life to be lived for the little itty bitty glories that can never really satisfy my heart's longing. What a tragedy 
if I didn't care about peace with God, that's not okay. So Jesus came. He came because only he can give hope by his grace. You can't escape your heart. Oh, you can move. You can change situations. You can get out of relationships. But the one thing you cannot escape is the condition of your heart. As we noted last week, that's because my problem is me. And so, a Lord and Savior must come. Even hearing that term Savior reminds us of our need for rescue. That's what a Savior does. That's our need. That's Christ's mission. But there's another thing these words do. They define for us the price of this mission. And it's captured in that last phrase, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Talk about a word of sovereign election, God's sovereign grace. This is not a universalism. It's not universal peace. Peace among those, it could be said, whom his favor is placed. Peace, even better, among those to whom His grace is given. You see, the only hope you have of peace is God's grace. And the vehicle of God's grace is the death of the Savior. That stolen glory and that shattered peace that leaves you guilty because you would rather live for the itty-bitty glories of your own making rather than the glory of Creator God. You have sought indeed to be God in your life, and rather than honoring the Creator, you have worshipped His creation, and the sentence of that guilt is death. And you do not understand that baby in the manger, unless you know that that baby was born to be a lamb. That he would come and from day one, all of his thoughts and all of his desires and all of his actions and all of his reactions and responses would be fully and completely and perfectly lived for the glory of God. He, on our behalf, would live for our glory. He would live the life that you and I cannot live and then he would climb on the cross and he would bear that penalty of which we deserve, that of death. And he would face the rejection of the heavenly Father so that we could know peace. Peace with God. Peace within and peace without with others. He came willingly. He knew what the price would be, that he must die so that we would live, so that raised out of humanity who doesn't care for peace with God, there would be a people, a company of people, his people who growingly are captivated by the glory of God, who love the fact that they have peace with God. But brothers and sisters, we still have a glory problem, don't we? And we regularly run after it. We don't get it right. Now recognize we also have a peace problem. We don't always care about peace with God. We don't care about peace within often. And we surely don't experience peace with one another. And so, the work of grace is as much needed in your heart as it is in those who have not yet been converted. And so the angels 
announce your hope today. They announce your redemption today. They announce your grace today. The grace of a life lived, the grace of a death offered so that you could live for his glory and that you may experience that in all ways possible, his peace. And so in a moment when we come to this table, offer to him those glories that you've run after. Confess, oh God, I have a glory problem. Forgive me. Fill me with your spirit and give me grace to live at peace with you, peace within, and peace with others. And God promises he will meet us in this mill and he will feast us upon our Savior and Lord through his spirit.